Hello, everyone. How are you? Great. Last day? It's time to get home, right? Okay. Uh, well, my name is Eduardo Silva. I'm from Treasure Data. And you are? Uh, Masahiro. Or Masa, for sure. Yeah. Has his email. And Masa is primarily Fluent D maintainer and Fluent Bed maintainer. We both work in the open source side of the company at Treasure Data. And actually, with the feedback during the intro session and the login session that we had in these days, who of you attended any of the login sessions that we did? Please raise your hand. Cool. So uh, most of the feedback, we get many questions about stack traces, multi-line multi logs, containers, and so on and so on. And it was hard to address all that kind of questions. So we were thinking about do we do some kind of presentation, or maybe we address the question because we just have 30 minutes. So we decided that it's better if we address most of the questions that you can have or expose your use case of logging in Kubernetes so we can try to help you better. Instead of log uh, on C, how FluentD works internally or how FluentBit works internally. That I think that will be more useful for you how to fix this problem. OK, make sense? But if you have any uh, question about the internals of FluentD or FluentBit, we can answer that too. So yeah, so please. The word is you. You have any question, use case that you would like to expose? Yeah. Well, on the, uh, the talk um, where you have the home overview, um, you mentioned that you can um, suggest um, parsers or filters for different log formats. Yeah, exactly. OK. OK, his question is, uh, in the last session we did, uh, especially in the getting started with logging in Kubernetes, we demonstrate a new feature of Fluentbit, which allows you in your pod to define or suggest a kind of parser. For example, when I'm running an Apache web server, this Apache web server has a log line, which doesn't have a structure, right? It's like a timestamp, the IP address, and many information. But I would like to have that information in a structured way. But uh, the only way to accomplish that in the past was just to do it through uh, after the storage, maybe, meaning we storage this information in Elasticsearch, and then we do the, the parsing. But in the last version of Fluentbit, we implement a feature where you can annotate your pod and suggest a special parser. So the log processor will know that this information that is coming in is, a, is Apache, so I can take it and process that information. Let me try to show you uh, how that works. So his question was how this is configured internally. The first thing you have to know, uh, this is only on Fluentbit for now. We expect to have it on Fluentd soon. Right, Masa? <laughs> so uh, in Fluentd and Fluentbit, you can define parsers. Parsers allow you to take unstructured information and convert that to a structured format. So if you've got a Fluentbit configuration, there's a file which is called parser.conf. You can have many parser files. And this parser file has different sections where you define your own parsers. So for example, uh, the first parser that is there is called Apache. Then it defines which is called a format. And a format internally is like a kind of backend that will allow you uh, to manage the data in some way. Here, I'm using the regular expression backend. So if you're using the regex, of course, you need to define some regular expression, which is here. Of course, the ideal is that we ended up this year with 100 of parser defined. OK, so but we need your help. And of course, uh, some time sub lookup information like this. So when you're running your uh, Fluent Bit, it runs as a daemon set. I'm going to switch the slides very quickly. This is the yesterday's slides, but cover pretty much the same. OK. So when Fluent Bit is running as a daemon set on a Kubernetes node, what it does, it reads the log files from the barlog containers path. It look up the container ID, container name, and then it goes back to the API server. 
when it gets the old labels and annotation, which is metadata. So on that step is where you can define in your pod, please use some parser for my data. And uh, the example from yesterday was this, pod apache.yaml. No, not that one. OK, sorry. Let's make a difference. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> OK, you will see that the only difference is that this line is going out, and of course the name change. And this one, these three, actually, are getting inserted. Let's show the, um, this file, this little file. This is like a pod definition. This pod or this container image, what it does is just to run and, and send some messages to the standard output, simulating an Apache web server. But if you look carefully, let me change the, oh yeah. Here, where is my mouse? Here. Uh, we have an annotation, which says fluentbed.io slash parser. And we are suggesting, and I say suggesting because the log processor can Take that instruction or just omit that instruction. Please use the Apache parser. And that Apache parser is defined here. Did you get the answer for the question? So I need to reconfigure the daemon set if I want to add there. Yes, for now. Because we. Yeah. <laughs> I know that somebody's going to push back on this. Yeah, uh, the thing is that people said, uh, why I cannot put my own regular expression in the pod? And that is, ah, no. But it makes sense. Because if you're running a huge cluster, and you have different teams like development, testing, production, and each one of them are using a different format, which will, hap will happen, no, it's impossible to make everybody use JSON. That will not happen. Not yet, at least in the five years. Uh, we're trying to figure out if implement that or not. But putting a regular expression inside your pod means that we need to encode that regular expression with base64 or put some quotes. We'll get very nasty, but it's something that will fix the problems. But when the log processor gets that regular expression, internally we need to compile that regular expression. And it will take some time. Maybe, well, I mean, a couple of milliseconds, but if you have hundreds of them, you can get some performance penalties. But we are decided that maybe that is the cost that a user is assuming to get. And that's it. OK. Now, next, we are going to be switching between Fluent Bit and Fluent D questions. So, Fluent D question. Any pains? Performance? Happiness? You can express yourself here. This is pretty informal, guys, so. OK, next one. Who was raising your hand? OK. Did you ever think about introducing some CRDs to define parsers? So for example, so that, that I can just have uh, the things that are written in the, in the parsers con, like in the, like in the CRD, that I can reference them, so that I split up from the pod definition and can re reuse that? Inside my team, for example, so when different teams have common log patterns, but each team individually, so that they could manage their parser configurations via CRDs, and then some way to auto configure the daemon set that way. Like an automatic way? Yeah, so, so basically just having this as a first class resource inside Kubernetes, and then doing the usual control operator pattern to reconfigure. Uh, or to bring this to Fluentbit? Yeah, actually, there's one thing. For example, in, in Fluentd now, you can um, can you define the parsers in a configuration, or it needs to be a plugin? Yeah. So it can be a configuration. Yeah. So we are in the same situation. Okay. The thing is, okay. uh, the thing is the following: when you create a pod and you upgrade that pod, that pod will is gonna get destroyed. I'm talking about technical terms. If it gets destroyed, we need to invalidate our cache. So we cannot guess that the next version will use the same content, the same format. That's a complexity. The complexity here is that the users have different formats. 
And maybe our new version from the developer, maybe he pushed a different log line format. So maybe we can try to do some kind of auto-discovery or auto-register this, but it's hard. That's why I said a minutes ago that maybe we're trying to expose some future where the person who's deploying this pod can define its own parser. And yeah, but just on the note. Yeah, because Fluentbit or FluentD runs as a daemon set. A daemon set is a pod that runs on every node. So if we get back to the slides, he's running Fluentd or Fluentbit. It doesn't matter. Both can do the same job. Okay? So uh, if your pods that are running on the left, they change. Okay? or whatever they do, this is always in the context of the node, this node. If you have 99 other nodes, that will not change. It's only for the scope of this pod. But it's a, it's a difficult problem, because from one side, everybody in login wants to have some performance. But in the other, they want flexibility. So I think that it's better that we provide some kind of balance, and you decide the way to go. But if you have any better idea how to improve this, we are hearing, you know. Actually, most of what you can see in FluentD and FluentBit is thanks to the users, to the conference, to the feedback that we get here. So if you have more ideas, they are welcome. At the beginning, this idea to include the parsers in, a in the pod comes from a conference a year ago. And we resist, no, 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 because performance, and but at the end, is, that is what uh, will solve the problem. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for that right now. So. Somebody else? No? So you look. Okay, so you want some flexibility to decide which index you're going to store the information. Yeah. Actually, that flexibility is in FluentD and not in FluentBet. Okay, then you can do that. Yeah, in FluentD you can do it. Uh, and so that is in the Elasticsearch plugin, right? Yeah, Elasticsearch plugin. Uh, so what it does are uh, uh, embedded values for the configuration. So if uh, the specifies uh, we want to use this value in the, this configuration, so Elasticsearch can decide uh, Elasticsearch plugin uh, sending to the uh, uh, target index based on the uh, record fields. I'm not sure for it, but for the Elasticsearch plugin can do it. Oops. So, but this, uh, but this feature is available since the version one. So, if you use the Fedora version zero point uh, zero dot twelve, uh, this feature is not available. But, oops, this one. Yeah, yeah, it's oh. the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> this is running Linux. You know, this is different setting for my Mac. So hard to. <laughs> 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 so. Um, What are you looking for specifically? Maybe index. Oh, control F, you can, you can try it. Oh, the index. Yeah, this is, wow. So, and also, Elasticsearch Plugin itself has a pro, uh, pro, uh, parameters for the target index key. So if you specify this target index uh, key parameter to your field, so this, body, uh, this uh, field value is used for the uh, index. Maybe uh, read me shows so how to use this. Okay, so this is the target index at our parameters and the index name. So we can uh, configure for this is this is a uh, maybe a such plugin specific parameter. So other plugins maybe doesn't support this field, but if you use such plugin, you can use this parameter. 
for uh, specifying the index. Yeah. Um, you can actually, well, with this particular plugin, you don't have to use the target index key. You can mm -hmm. just use the log stash index together with buffers, and it works the same. So you can use, it's, it's kind of like dynamic. You can use fields uh, in uh, uh, the log stash index. If you use together with buffers, it works. Ah, okay. The key in the, in the buffer. Yeah, he said that uh, because, okay, in the Fluentd configuration, for example, um, I don't have everything about Fluentd here, but uh, for example, if you're going to send this to Elasticsearch, for example, index key or no, um, index prefix. Doesn't matter. You can look at the documentation. There is a way. I, I don't, I'm not. Correct me if I'm wrong. For example, you can do like Kubernetes that namespace. If yeah. that information comes in the record. Uh, you also have to specify the buffer. Yeah. You do buffer and oh. then you specify Kubernetes. And yeah, he's a fluent expert. Mm -hmm. gonna... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Names is SAP, SAP. Yeah, the, th the thing is that FluentD gives you the flexibility to compose certain parameters of the configuration with the information that comes in your record, in your log file. That's why it's so flexible. So sometimes Fluentbit is good, but Fluentd I would say it's more flexible for these kind of cases. So if you want to have different um, different kind of indexes based on the Kubernetes namespace or or some specific label, I think you should go with Fluentd. Please. Apart from moving to Fluentbit, what strategies uh, you have to deal with? Or OM killer in Fluentd. What, what, which is the, the, the things to, to look when you're having your kernel killing Fluentd in, in Kubernetes, for example, which is my case. So you get a lot of uh, OM killer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the OM killer happens because the kernel says, for some reason, this process is consuming too much memory. Right? Or I need to survive, I need to kill someone. But in the container space, if your container has a limit and your process reaches the limit, you are the first one to be killed. It doesn't matter if you have more uh, memory available in the system. So, if you want to ask for that. So, for Friendly, so Friendly has a, a written in the Ruby. So, the one approach is uh, configuring uh, configure the uh, GC parameters to call the uh, GC, uh, so which memory allocated, uh, the trigger of the memory allocations. So if you trigger the value the lower than the one, so I, I'm not sure uh, uh, which parameter name is correct, but uh, maybe I, uh, friendly, uh, friendly documentation uh, shows the uh, uh, parameter example. So using the uh, settings the uh, uh, correct correct GC parameter. So frequently, uh, uh, Ruby's uh, calls the GC frequently to reduce the uh, memory uh, uh, memory usage. And another one is uh, set, setting the smaller uh, memory uh, buffer settings. So frequent flash and the small chunks. So it reduces the uh, it also reduces the memory uh, usage. But it depends on the plugins or. Uh, data, data, data traffic. So, if you uh, have a uh, uh, no, uh, if you want to uh, collect the information, maybe you please post the uh, question on the mailing list or. Uh, we found some case like uh, a year ago that uh, we were working with the guys from Google. I don't know if is anybody from Google here. Anyone? Yeah, we got some pushback about memory usage in Fluentd. Right? You know that it's a Ruby stack, but uh, we found that problem that when running, uh, when, when you run a log collector like this, you usually need to allocate or use a small chunks of memory. 
And at some point, if your memory allocator is not good enough, you're going to get a lot of fragmentation. Pretty much similar to what you get in a hard disk. Okay, so the memory that you're using, maybe it's not the total. The total is what you're not using, plus the memory that is reserved for your process. So if you get a lot of fragmentation, your memory will go up. And two things, to reduce a fragmentation on that moment, we started using jmalloc, the jmalloc memory allocator. And actually, we found that jmalloc, the fragmentation is quite low compared with uh, glyph So make sure that your Docker image is using jmalloc. And the second thing, as Massa said, uh, well, in Fluentd, we have buffering. Buffering either in memory or in the file system. What means buffering? That the old data was processed and it's ready to go out. But if for some reason the output is down or you cannot flush the data, this kind of information which is processed starts to grow somewhere. So for Kubernetes, you want that this grows in the file system and not in memory. So first thing, make sure you're using file system buffering, jmalloc, and, and adjust the buffers. But mo most of the deployments in Kubernetes, and I'm seeing that they have like a limit of 200 megabytes for FluentD. But also, as Massa said, it depends on the traffic. Because people say, oh, this is using too much memory. OK, how much data are you ingesting? Oh, like 100,000 records per second. So, <laughs> man, it's, it's, you are ingesting too much data. You are asking to process that data. And you need the resources for that. So it, it, I think that it depends. That are the mechanisms in FluentD. In Fluentbit, there's something different because we do buffering different. And there's an option. Fluentbit. So. Mm. No, it's not here. Back pressure. Sometimes we forget what we write. That option, membuff limit. So basically, we assume that your log files are your buffer, because they're in your file system. They are not going to be deleted. OK? So what we do, if you enable, enable that option, and that option is enabled in, the, in our spec files for Kubernetes and Fluent Beta specifically, means that, OK, if you're reading a lot of files, and I read, for example, five megabytes of memory, and I ingest that limit, that means that those, uh, if I surpass that limit, for example, I have five me megabytes of data, I cannot read more log files. So Intel is paused. Until this data is flushed, then I can read more. So this model works really good in Kubernetes only, because the data is in the file system. But if you are getting messages over the network, it will not work because you are going to start dropping messages. So these are the two ways. Everything is about buffering, even in networking. The network cards, everything is buffering. So it's not a strong sold answer, but yeah, you have to adjust it. Yeah. Don't log your, all your data. Yes. If your pod dies, your logs persist in the file system. Yeah. Yeah, in Kubernetes, if you have a pod running, you have a associated a namespace, pod name, and pod ID. If your pod crashes, a Kubernetes likely is going to restart it, create a new one. Well, it's not restarted, they create a new one. A new one is the same namespace, pod name, but a different ID. Oh, if FluentD crashes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> well, we lost one minute. And the FluentD crashes, so it means uh, FluentD pods. Okay. But if you, uh, if you uh, restart the FluentD, uh, the FluentD uh, for Intel, Intel plugin uh, records the uh, positioning of uh, how we are with the read from the file. So if you uh, restart the front read correctly, uh, restart the uh, reading log files from the last point. So maybe no deprecation or what? Yeah, 
No, the database is not in the pod. Actually, what we do when we start the daemon sets in FluentD and FluentBet, what we do is to mount the node bar log containers, so bar log path into the container. So we always write the database into the node and not into the container. So if FluentD crashes, it doesn't matter, well, it matters, <laughs> but it doesn't matter from the term that it knows what was the last position and the last file that was consuming because there's a database file. If you don't enable the database file, well, you're going to start consuming everything from the, the beginning. Okay. We have a question from you. Yeah. Is there actually a limit for the for the time system buffer on the on the node? Is there a way to limit how much how much data the pod can So you want kind of throttle the the data, or you want to limit the the amount of traffic? I'm wondering how to how to set this because because it also influences this back 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 pressure, right? Yeah. So how to limit the data traffic? I think that uh, that is hard because there are two scenarios. When you have a normal log line, that is fine, right? Like 32, uh, a couple of ca characters, that's fine. But there are cases where people ingest logs which are really, really long. So it's just one record, but could be like a hundred of the others. So it's a matter of how big are your logs, entries, and how amount of records per second. So uh, for FluentD, there's some plugins that you can say, please don't pass this limit. And in FluentBit, see that 13, there's a new plugin was contributed recently for, by Anchor Free that you can limit also the traffic. It's not ideal because they're dropping data. Any other questions? Martin. Uh, are you planning to expand monitoring of Fluentd? Because currently, uh, Matrix that I installed in Fluentd is not uh, really basic. Uh, do you plan to mm -hmm. allow uh, plugins, uh, Fluentd plugins, to add new Matrix? Is Fluentd or Fluentd? Ah, okay. So his question is: Having that in FluentD, the metrics can be exposed through a plugin. So metrics become like events inside FluentD, but in FluentBet, they just ex exist internally and cannot be exposed. So uh, you're welcome to open a GitHub issue. <laughs> yeah, because metrics is a new stuff. Yeah, we yeah we never planned that. So, but I would like to understand better the use case. How to if it's good or not? No, not good or not. If it's good to invest time on that, or maybe do it in a different way. If you can create an issue and document the use case, so maybe we can try to work around that. More questions? Nobody. Is anything that you would like to know? We have a couple of minutes yet. What would you like to know? <laughs> Any problems? Are you happy with it? Uh, who's not using FluentD or FluentBit? He's not. So you miss it, the, the intro session. Do you went to the intro sessions? You miss it, that. But <laughs> yeah, uh, any, anyways. So um, just, uh, just to clarify for people who's um, new on this, se on this session, so FluentD is like uh, the main project under the CNCF. And a FluentD also is a whole ecosystem. And as an ecosystem, we have SDKs for different languages. And sometimes people is getting confused about why FluentD, why FluentBet. And happens that uh, some, in some use cases, people need to have something lightweight than FluentD. For one side, FluentD has really strong uh, aggregation, buffering in the file system and in memory. FluentBit is just in memory, and it's not strong in aggregation. So if you care about aggregation, you will go with FluentD. Also, there's some flexibility in FluentD that you don't have in FluentBit. For example, as Massa exposed the configuration files, you cannot compose dynamic configuration using the record information. But in FluentD, you can do it. 
And FluentD, you have like 700 plugins. And I will say like 99% made by the community. In FluentBit, we have 45. So and there's, it's a matter also of what, uh, what are your use cases and what is better for you. The thing is that the both, so FluentBit is a FluentD project, and both are under the CNCF, and both are sponsored by the same company. Okay. Do you have more questions, comments, something that we can help with? There's one question. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if it's updated, but in the Fluent Bit, there is. And the Fluent D also, there's one reference Fluent D and Fluent Bit. Okay. There you go. Well, we need to update the number of plugins, but. <laughs> yeah, there's one comparison. Actually, if you go to the Fluent D website, Resources, Fluent Bit. So, any more questions, comments, <coughs> something that we can help with? Um, when I edit uh, or when I want to add new parser rules to Fluent Bit, um, do I have to restart uh, parts or could it be automatically detected that file changes? Or do you mean uh, I created my pod, I, I forget to add the annotation? Yeah, I mean, uh, not, not the annotation, I mean the, the shipper of the Google set. So I, I reckon that the parsers.com has to be inside that, uh, inside the daemon set, right? Yeah, if you modify, if you need to extend uh, your fluent bit parsers, yeah. you need to restart it. Not at the moment. Okay. No, uh, there's is, not. Is this something planned, or do you think about that? Or? Actually, somebody asked about that, but not in the Kubernetes space, because in the Kubernetes space, restart a program is quite the rule. <laughs> it's, for example, if you're going to make, because in Kubernetes, there's a concept of immutability. So if you have some configuration with some program, and something will change, that is not the same anymore. It's a new thing. So if so, you don't want to get okay. So, but actually, you I don't know how that works in Kubernetes because you will need to ingest a new config map, and if you ingest a new config map, you need to restart, right? I don't know how you can send a sig hub to the whole nodes. I'm not sure if that's possible. So I understand your point. Could be useful, I think. Yeah, maybe. Because somebody asked about that, but not for Kubernetes. They ask it for normal servers. Yeah, same thing, right? Yeah. No, at the moment, it's not supported. But uh, yeah, we can have a discussion on GitHub about it. We are pretty open to it. So everything that we do in the project is about the priorities, the urgency of the community. So there comes a question to mind if um, it fits restarting, uh, time it is restarting, uh, is there a way to like back, go back in time and send log log data that is accumulated in the time of the restart of the of the program? Yeah, his question is: If I'm going to restart Fluent Bit, I'm I'm processing my logs. I stop Fluent Bit when I restart or create a new pod of Fluent Bit. I'm going to continue from where? If you're using the database file, it's going to continue from the last file and last position that when it was stopped. So if you restart a minute later, it's going to take it back from the last one. Mm -hmm. Unless your files were rotated and deleted on this, on this period. Yeah, you cannot do anything at that moment. But it will not take a minute. It's a, it's a matter of one second, two seconds. Yeah, but yeah if you enable the database file, same for FluentD. Yeah. For the general data, uh, center, you Uh, which user from which computer logged in or something like that. 
not only um, timestamp and a message, uh, but uh, really have it in a detailed um, representation. Do you have a library of um, such patterns that would make parsing of block parts much easier? Yeah, his question is about, okay, if I have my application triggering a message, I need more information than the timestamp. I need some context, origin, host, node, container ID, container name, and port information, right? So all of that is made by FluentD and Fluent Bit filters by you. So if you run a container, let me have the slides here. Let me show you. Okay, this is your question. You trigger a message, and you get some context. But uh, are you meaning local syslog or remote syslog? Well, uh, where to parse it doesn't matter, I think. But um, I'm not referring really to the container use case. But if you have uh, any log line, like uh, from SSH, and you want to um, have all the details of uh, which user logged in from which host or something like that, Mm. Uh, you need to parse uh, this log string yeah. uh, much more in detail than having one string which is called log, and then uh, you have the uh, string user xy logged in from host IP address or so, but you want to have all these details in, for example, like text search uh, yeah. without a um, global search, full text search. That is the work of the parser. Yeah. So <laughs> if you have an SSH service, you're likely going to define a SSH parser. So every time that some lines uh, and your pod suggests a SSH parser, it's going to take all that information and create new fields, like origin, username, timestamp, the message, or whatever he's doing. And then you query using those specific, it's like a JSON map, a key value. And also, it's not libraries, it's a configuration that the one that I just show. For example, uh, should I save this? Yeah, be safe. So, um, oh. so uh, what would you do is kind of SSH, regex, and here you define your pattern. Is there a public repository of such parser files for different, mostly standardized? Ah, files. okay, mostly standardized. <laughs> Where you can see my list of parsers that I can use? Well, actually, in there's not like an official list, but this is not like the, the answer that the users like. But let's look at the source code. <laughs> <laughs> The first day when I started my job at Treasure Data, I came to Sara, the FluentD creator, and I had a really deep question. Sara, I had this question. Oh, let's look at the code. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they listen. So, okay. So in the FluentBit repository, we have the configuration here, and everything that starts with parsers are parsers. So we have for OpenStack, for Java, Extra, Cinder. This is the same one, the same parser that I was just showing you in the terminal. But I agree that we miss a cute web page with the whole format. And that is something that we need uh, some help with. If you want to help to write documentation for it, it would be great. Yeah. Every single possible log line, expect every field they have. Okay, that, is, that has uh, some you penalty. Yeah, actually, we don't want to follow that way. We want that you choose what you can try for each uh, log line. Maybe you can define multiple parsers. That is not supported, but it's a good idea. Because if we try to apply all of them, that will be really expensive, and we don't want to become Logstash. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? We need to add something different. Just in JSON and 
Just JSON? Yeah, you can, yeah, but tell that to the developers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's not up to us. We implement the things to parse the information, but there's not much that we can do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you don't have more questions, we appreciate your attention here and thanks for coming. <laughs>